and we are live. Good morning to every evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, today, I have an interesting guest, I think. Um, I've been on YouTube about two years now, maybe coming up to th three years. And in that time, I've met some really interesting people. And one of them is Andrew. Andrew contacts me a week and not contact each other almost on a daily basis. And we have a lot of interesting things in our lives, some of which are similar, many of which are very, very different. But I've invited Andrew on. This is Andrew's very first attempt at a live stream. So I've invited him on to talk about the differences between China and the U.S. as he perceives them. Andrew is a former U.S. Uh, service person, a veteran of Desert Storm, and um, an interesting character because he has a very different perception of America because of his background. So, Andrew, without any further ado, welcome. Welcome aboard. Welcome to Jerry's Take on China. Thank you for agreeing well, you. to this. And um, tell us a little oh, bit about your very... Point. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Cut out. I just said we've been we've been trying to do this for weeks. I'm glad I was finally able to schedule it. Okay. Yeah, we have been trying to do it for a long time, and we both have busy schedules. Tell us a little bit about your background, oh, um, because Jerry. you are not you're not a classic or standard American, right? Probably Can you hear not. Me? Um, right. I guess well, you and I spoke. Yeah, you, you keep cutting in and out. Maybe I'll have to do the show, Jerry. <laughs> uh, no. So um, in my case, um, my uh, my my mother was born in Germany in 1935. <clears throat> and when the war was over, her family was on the east side. Well, most of it. Part of it was in the west and part was in the east. And in, when my mother was in high school, uh, East Germany revolted against uh, the Russian occupation. And my mother fought with her classmates against Russian soldiers in the streets. She actually disabled a number of Russian tanks in the incident. And of course, as you know, his, historically it was put down. And a couple of years later, the secret police were still looking for people who were involved in the incident. And they eventually started catching up to my mother. And by this point, she only had her great, her grandmother was living with her and her grandmother heard first and her grandmother told her to flee to the West where her mother was living. So my grandma, my mother escaped East Germany on a good Friday. And unfortunately what happened afterwards was when my mother failed to show up for work, the secret police picked up my, my great grandmother and they tortured her to find out where my mother was, but she was able to trick them into believing that she honestly had no idea where my mother was. Eventually, my mother made it to England where her mother had remarried to an Englishman. And there she met my father, who was in the Air Force. And they got married and uh, came to the United States and moved to, uh, we, I live in Middle Tennessee, and there used to be an active duty Air Force base here in Middle Tennessee. And so my father was assigned here from 1960 until he retired a decade later from the Air Force. So I've, I've always lived in Tennessee, but I've had my grandparents lived in England. So I was able as a child, especially to travel often to Europe. And then from England, you could make smaller trips to Africa or Asia or other locations. So I had a very well-rounded background as a child. Um, my parents were also very much into education. And my father very much, we, had, we always had libraries in our houses. And my father had me doing book reports before I even started first grade. So mm -hmm. I was well well educated in a lot of history and geography and things like that. Um, later on, I uh, went, I'm sorry, you were going to say something. I was going to say that's a, that's a very interesting background. How many people of your contemporaries in Tennessee have traveled like you've traveled? Well, some people have traveled, but they often will travel to the Bahamas or Canada or Mexico. As far as people I know personally, um, no one I know has traveled in the same locations that I have. 
I think that's I mean, I was even as a child, I got to go to Franco, Spain, just as an example. Right. This is possibly part of the reason why there is a um, a dearth, a, a lack, a very sad lack of world experience in Americans. I mean, I, I interact with Americans every day. And it's clear they haven't got a clue. They don't know where Taiwan is. They don't know where Korea is. They don't know where Vietnam is. They just know it's all over there. You know, that's uh, as far as they're concerned. Uh, and yeah, I've seen the the, the comedies yeah. where where people show a, a map without names and say where where is uh, you know, show us a country in Africa and they can't even find Africa. Uh, you've actually oh. been there. Hmm. Yes, I've been. Um... And um, what we were what we, what we were going to talk about on that? Um, my I thought we were when when my interest in China is unusual. Um, right. When I was a child uh, here in the United States, China was an island in the Pacific. There was a place next to it that was sometimes called Red China, but there are actually maps I still have that show it will say China and it'll just be in, in the Taiwan Strait, but it won't show the big part. You know, every right. now and then they would call it red China as opposed to real China, which was the island. <clears throat> and where I discovered China was uh, China, funny enough, wasn't mentioned that much in the United States on the news, at least as far as I perceived as a child in the later 60s. But when I went to my grandparents' house in England, they showed a lot more world news than we received. And my first experience with China was watching the television. There were all these angry people who were mm -hmm. shouting and yelling and waving little red books in the air. And I was like, who are these people and what are they so angry about? Right. And um, over time, uh, again, at that time, the Internet was called books and you didn't have a way you could just look something up. I had to start researching even as a child about this. And I discovered this amazing country that is at least as old as the world. And it's it has this rich tapestry of ancient history and modern history. And I, I started studying everything I could find. I still have every one of my books and articles on China that I collected in the 70s and 80s. Um, my parents, who were very big on education, as I mentioned, funny enough, were not interested at all in China. I would be reading a book and I would find some very interesting fact and I would try to tell one of them and they would be like, oh, OK, you know, we're not interested. China's not important. So for a long time, I felt like I was the only person that was really interested in this country. And mm -hmm. in the 1980s, I go to college. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering, just like President Xi does. And while I was at university, I was a huge advocate of China and the United States becoming friends in the 1980s. And again, even though that had a very cosmopolitan school, China was still nothing to most people. I Why told you a, a story no. once. Um, Go on. Well, I, I was going to say that by the 1980s, Kissinger and Nixon had been there, had been here. And um, they had spent time oh, yeah. here. They had, they had effectively opened it up. I would have thought that you would not have been a lone voice. You would have been in the majority of people saying, yeah, we've got to open this up and exploit this opportunity because it was a huge opportunity for the United States to open China. Well, what, one thing I like to mention when I, when I talk to people and, and work on things is that studying pop culture is very useful for discovering uh, – trends and feelings about a lot of subjects. And by the 1980s, well, by the, in the 60s, if you watch old 60s shows, mm -hmm. the Chinese are almost always the villains, right? Like you watch Goldfinger, they supply the nuclear bomb. And television shows in the 60s, the Chinese are usually, the Chinese characters either don't say much or they talk like the little red book, right? They all just these little pithy quotes. By the 70s, you get television shows where the Chinese are not always the bad guys, but they are still are the bad guys most of the time. But by the 80s, that was completely different. When, when Ronald Reagan went to uh, China, that, that was a major turnaround in 1984. 
he um, had long had the idea that all communists just work for Moscow and going to China really opened up his eyes. And at the same time, pop culture opened up a lot more in the United States. For example, a very popular show at the time was The Love Boat. And The Love Boat in 1983 did a, a several, epi several uh, episode visit to China because there were, at that time, tours were opening up that you could take, you know, pleasure cruises to China. There's mm -hmm. a movie that a lot of my friends greatly enjoy called uh, Red Dawn, which is about a Soviet invasion of the United States in 1984. And in that movie, NATO has refused to help the United States in a war with the Soviet Union. But our main ally in that war was China against the Soviets. So there was a there was a big shift. Things were starting to come. But still, China was still considered this little backwards country. I mean, in the later 80s, when I was take, I was working on an MBA. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, you, you keep going, keep going. Oh, oh, Jerry, I could keep you here for days. <laughs> sorry. Uh, anyway, um, so I told you about this incident. I was a class I was taking, and we were discussing developing areas of business uh, in a, in, as I was working on MBA class. And... I popped up my usual answer that I've been doing all through the 80s. China. China is going to be this great place to open up for business. And I told you what the professor said, but I'll mention it here on the show. The professor scoffed at me, and I'm quoting. He said, China, who the hell would ever want to invest in that place? And then he burst out laughing at me, and the whole class laughed too, which didn't hurt my feelings because I knew they were all wrong anyway. So but there was a right. lot of that. There was a lot. China was still considered this backwards country in all these little gray Mao suits. They were nice and they were our friends against Russia. But the real enemy, and this is what we we're going to talk about. So in the 1980s was Japan. Japan was public enemy number one. You can look at the um, the social, well, not social media, excuse me, the uh, pop culture from that time. You can see that. J Japan was it. Japan was the greatest threat the United States had ever done, had met. And what was their crime? What was the one thing Japan had done wrong? They were at GDP number two. That mm -hmm. was it. Remember, uh, the, the congressman bought some Toshiba products and smashed them on yep. the on the steps of the uh, congressional building. And of course, yep. Toshiba, all they said was, hey, they already paid for it. We don't care what they do with it. But um, today with all the trouble that the U.S. and China have, it's exactly a repeat. It's actually a bad repeat. It's a bad sequel of what happened yeah. in the 80s. Now that China is number two, they're the giantest threat in the world. Yeah, the interesting thing is Japan has just gone down. It's just slipped from the third to the fourth <laughs> place. And this is as a direct result of that um, Exactly what they're trying to do now to China, which they're, they're not doing so cleverly this time around. Um, the the ev yeah. every single stymie that they put onto China, it seems that China has an answer for it. Now, yet yeah, it creates a hiccup, it creates an issue, it creates a stalling of whatever it was that was going ahead. But look where Huawei is now. I mean, they've they've moved. They're still making yeah. great telephones. And they're selling their telephones all through Africa, South America, Central America. They're selling them lots in China. Uh, Huawei will be back at number one spot in telephones probably quite soon. Um, but they're also oh, yeah. selling cars. <laughs> you know, they've, they've moved into cars successfully. The Aito is a completely Harmony OS-driven car. And it's, uh, it's in conjunction with Huawei because they couldn't go down that track. They just turned direction and went down that track. Yeah. So the, I remember the Toshiba. Are never able. Mm. Oh yeah, Sorry. I remember the Toshiba thing. The, the the hammers on on the on the lawn outside of I think it was the Capitol building or the uh, I don't know what the name of yeah. the building is. It was the Capitol building. Right, right, right. And so, in fact, there was a oh, I'm sorry, there was a book that came out in 1991 called The Coming War with Japan, and it was all about how America was going to have to destroy Japan. For what reason? Because they were GDP number two. That was mm -hmm. it. It's not like Japan was building military bases all over the world 
or were thinking about reconquering Asia, they were at number two, they might become number one, let's stop them. And now I believe recently there was a book that said, um, that was called The Coming War with China too, right? Correct, yep. Yeah. 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 Um, it, it just, yeah. Th there's there's two things that are happening at the moment. There is a group of um, predictions, uh, and the, and these two predictions are are completely uh, unconnected or disconnected. The group of predictions. One prediction is that there's a coming war with China, and China is the biggest, largest mi military threat in history. Uh, a big bigger threat than Hitler ever was. A bigger threat than the Russian uh, Soviet Union ever was. China is the biggest military threat, mm. except that there's no precedent for that. And and coupled with that, we have a series of threats called the, you know, we have the coming war with China and the coming collapse of China in the same era. Yeah. These two things are both happening in conjunction. Now, I see that from, a, from an outsider's perspective. I'm looking at America. America is the world's most powerful military. It is the world's most dangerous military. And it, and it certainly is the largest threat to global peace, peace in my opinion, <laughs> in the world. Now, having yeah. said that, it's also collapsing. I can see that their, their GDP is, is, is fraudulent. It's a fraudulent GDP. Their life expectancy is declining. Poverty is increasing. Homelessness increasing. Drugs increasing. Crime increasing. Gun deaths increasing. Everything that's a negative about America indicates that the only thing they have that is not going in the negative way is military industrial complex profits pretty much that's it you take mm -hmm. that out then so there you do have a situation where you have a collapsing economy at the same time as the world's largest military posturing and being very dangerous if they pull out of the middle east the middle east will be over if they pull out of ukraine ukraine will be over but then of course they'll say that proves weakness so they don't want to show that weakness. So you do have this this thing that they're nope. predicting with with China, which which is contradictory and can't happen. You can't have a collapse at the same time right. as the most dangerous threat. It is actually the situation we have with America. Mm -hmm. Well, it's projecting, well, isn't it? Yeah, it is. What, what do mean, you think about it? That's, is, that's is, am it I right, is. or is, is there more to this? Well, you're correct. I mean, but I, I did want to say one thing. Uh, well, I, I mean, I'm in my notes. I made. Some, I wanted cool. to say that more than anything else, I, I think people overseas should understand that Americans are good people. They really are good people. I mean, what you deal with is the effects of our government reaching out to other countries, right? That's what you guys see. You see mm -hmm. the boot of America on people, but the vast majority of Americans are very good people. They're, they're, they're honest. They take care of each other as much as they can. But remember the need is just horribly overwhelming right now. I mean, I, I jokingly said the other day that if you, if you and I took a random bunch of Chinese and American families into my yard and we threw a huge barbecue, okay, everyone would have a great time. Everyone would get yeah. along. The children would play. We would have a wonderful time. And everybody would reach out and go, wow, those guys are really nice. And it's what you mentioned earlier. Americans are only fed one line on all this stuff, right? Like the Ukraine war and all these other there's only There's only one line. <clears throat> and unfortunately, there's snarky people like me that like to poke holes in that. So I can get myself into trouble occasionally. But yeah. Americans are good people. American service members, uh, all American service members are my brothers and sisters. They're my extended family and they are good people too. But like any organization, you will occasionally get bad ones or something bad happens when they go to places. I mean, if there is Americans see themselves as the good guys around the world. Right. That is an important thing to remember. Whenever they do anything, even if it's hypocritical or it breaks an agreement, they always see that they're doing the right thing. They may not realize it or they may not understand, but they definitely see themselves as always in the right 
doing the right things for others, even if it kills everybody in the process. <laughs> so, yeah, I think I think what people outside no, I, I I know you're right. Actually, I've met many great Americans. There's a lot of them over here. I I'm, I always make jokes that the good Americans come to China. Um, I I see this, and and by the same token, I see the reverse. Most people that I deal with online who who dislike China, they they will always say, "I love the Chinese people, but I hate their government." And I say, right. well, "Why do you hate their government?" Right. Oh, because they're so oppressive. Well, hang on and say, "Do you know that the Chinese people love their government? Ninety percent. That's a proven fact. Now, ninety percent love their government. Oh, right. yeah. They're, well, they they're forced to. Otherwise, they'd be shot if they didn't. And my comment to them is, why don't you come and have a look? And half the time, more than half the time, I mean, I, I should make a, I should keep a record of this because this is be, this would be a great uh, PhD study." I would say more than half the people that I deal with say I wouldn't set foot in China. So, in other words, you don't love the Chinese people, you don't like China, mm. you, you're, you're afraid of China, you think that Chinese people are harmful to you. Right. And I think that a lot of a lot of Americans feel, think that way. But you know, I've never yet mm. met a Chinese person who dislikes America. I've never yet, I've never met one. And they, they they all love you. Mm. They look up to you. They respect you. They respect you as a country. They know that what you say is correct. Americans are good people. Mm -hmm. And if I say to them, well, what what about the 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 wars? Oh, well, yeah, yeah, I know. They but they do it for the right reasons. So your yeah, people in China actually believe that of you. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. mm. Oh yes. I mean, as I said. Um, you and I have discussed a lot out of here, but obviously the people listening have not heard our conversation. Yeah. So I'll bring it yeah, up. I mean, by all means, repeat, repeat yourself. A, a big, a big piece of my life. I was a researcher analyst, as I mentioned before. My father's making me do <clears throat> studies before I'm even in first grade, and I, I'll always remember one. I'm I'm five years old, and my father is making me research. He said, "I want you to discover." the social, political, and economic reasons that the Mongol Empire held together. And then after I wrote that one, he said, okay, now do me another one. Give me the social, political, and economic reasons that it fell apart. So, yeah, I've had a very strange childhood, as, as you were mentioning from before. Very interesting. But also I, I, my background as, as an engineer, scientist, soldier, has taught me when I do research and analysis, I learned to be very in the middle, the way you're supposed to be. Uh, scientists don't go in with preconceived notions when you work mm -hmm. on a theory, right? And so when I was a research analyst a long time ago, I had already eliminated most tribalism in my life, um, except for a very small number of tribalism, like my family and my owes to the U.S. government for, as a service member. I eliminated all my tribalisms. I don't even have a favorite sports team of any kind. Right. I'll watch a game with friends and I'll say, hey, that was a good play. And then they get mad at me because it was the other team. I'm like, oh, sorry, I don't rooting for either team, you know. So the funny part about it is I can go when I was doing research and analysis. Um, that was around the time that the Soviet Union was falling apart. And I had been made to study the Soviets and the Warsaw Pact and all that to understand them better. And when I did do all that research, what I discovered was they were terrified of us. They thought we were going to attack them. And at mm -hmm. the same time, we were terrified of them thinking they were going to attack us. And I said, you know, guys, if you just come together, you could overcome this. Right. Mm -hmm. You're both too afraid mm -hmm. to reach out to the other side. And then of course, once the Soviets collapse, and it's the same thing with China, you know, a lot of like what you said, people just have these preconceived notions of China because it was fed to them by the media and there's no need to research it because it's all they ever hear. Mm. I mean, if, if the Chinese were to mm. ask me, what are we doing wrong? I would say China doesn't really understand Americans and Americans certainly don't understand China. China, to America, and this is just analysis, uh, Chinese people look different, they speak differently, they think differently, they worship differently. There's Everything about the country is almost alien to Americans. 
-hmm. And a lot of people either they can't can't take the time or they're not able to take the time to, to, to learn about these other people. But I have had that opportunity and I've been able to see the things that China and the United States have in common. I mean, I'm a huge proponent of the G2, uh, the group of two. Have you ever heard? Have you heard that term yeah, before? Yeah. Yep. In America, China. Where, um, yeah, the, the two largest economies on Earth should get together. That's us and you. And we could fix all the problems in the world. There's no alliance available that could stop us economically. Yeah. Oh, sorry. What, I mean, the what, place you are at. <laughs> yeah. What you've just identified there, Andrew, is called um, cultural dimensions. Um, I, I actually studied this at master's level, yeah. too. And um, it, it, it's oh, the differences wonderful. between us. Chi China is a collective society that has what's called a power distance index. The power distance index means it has a much yep. greater respect for hierarchy than the, uh, the low power distance index countries like America. And, and consequently, Americans mm -hmm. do not know what Chinese people are thinking or how they will behave. It's a behavior. It's a psychological or psychology of behavioral right. science. And um, it's been studied at, at great uh, in great depth. And there's a very, very famous mm -hmm. guy in Hong Kong called Michael Harris Bond. He uses the name Harris, his middle name, because Michael Bond wrote Paddington Bear. And uh, Paddington they were Bear. growing up. Yeah. I have a Paddington Bear right over here. <laughs> there you go. Well, the book was written by Michael Bond. So there's a psychologist in Hong Ooh. Kong who calls himself Michael Harris Bond because of it. Um, and he he's identified various different cultures of the Chinese. And what it needs, I think, you, you, said, you said it right, but if uh, Blinken's over here again today, he's arriving today uh, for more meetings in China. Yeah. Now, when he sits down, his advice is coming from his Chinese ambassador and his military and his defense and his intelligence, and he's getting advice from the wrong people. What he should be doing is sitting down with a psychologist and saying, how do I need to understand these guys? Right, okay, well, when yeah, they say this- He didn't this, call me. No, he, he didn't call me either, and he never will. Um, <laughs> so the, the, this, I'm just gonna show an interesting point here. Uh, many young women, and this is true, young women are moving up. to China because it's safe, very safe here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, let's let's go on with your you you've um, you moved into the military. I want to talk about your military service. First of all, how old were you, and what motivated you to join the military? Did you hear that question? You're going really slow. Okay. My, my question where? was, yeah, my, my question was, we seem to have some kind of a delay or a lag here. When you yeah. were young, you joined the military. How old were you and what, what motivated you to do that? Well, I mean, here in the United States, sorry. Go on. I go you all hear over me the place. Okay? You gotta, you gotta pin me down. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, I, I just asked the question: How old okay. were you, and what um, motivated you well, to join the military? It, okay, sorry. You're so it's going slow. Oh, yeah. that is the simplest question in my family. Um. My family were latecomers to America. We were not here on the Mayflower or any of those other things. But um, in every country that, yeah, you're, you, you were really slow. What motivated me to join? Yeah. The simple question answer to that is that uh, my family, yo, mm, you're 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 stretching. You're getting really slow. I'm, I'm not saying anything. If the problem seems to be your end. How old was I when I wanted to join? Uh, that's easy. The first thing I can remember. My family, um, no matter what country we've lived in, my family, both, both men and women, have all served in the service. Almost every man and woman in my family wore military uniform at some point in their lives. Um, there are actually, I've done some family research and in the first world war, 
parts of my French family and parts of my German family were shelling each other at Verdun. So uh, there you go. So what motivated me is ever since I was a child, the, the, as the, I never wanted to be a policeman or a fireman or an astronaut or anything like that. There was only one job for me, and that was to become an Army officer. Now, my father was in the Air Force, as I mentioned. He, he actually had been in all the branches, but he, he flew aircraft in all of them. And the person who influenced me the most was my English grandfather, who um, was in the Second World War. My, he was my step-grandfather, actually, but I never thought of I didn't even know that he was what it was step was until I was maybe, you know, in middle school. And mm. I loved him to death. And he had served with the Royal Horse Artillery in the Second World War. And he motivated me to want to get in the service. So literally from the earliest thought I can remember, my only thought was to become a soldier. You should see, I, I don't know if you remember them from England, the air fix little figures. Yeah, air fix kids, I still yeah. have all mine. So I was yeah. fighting battles in my bedroom, making up my own rules ever since I was a child. So the first chance mm. I got, uh, I, I joined ROTC in college when I was 18. Now, unfortunately for me, um, I had a lot of childhood illnesses, so it made it really difficult for me to run. And I was always afraid that I was never going to complete, actually get into the service. Um, but just through sheer perseverance, I was able to serve and overcome that. And plus, I've been studying it my whole life. So like when I was in uh, military training schools, I scored 200 percent on all my tests because I'd already I'd already learned all the subjects before I got there. So eventually <clears throat> I started out in the Army. I switched to the Navy and then eventually I went back to the Army. But while I was in the Navy, my unit was activated. I was a CB at that time, the Naval Construction mm -hmm. Troops, and we were activated to go to Desert Storm. And because of my um, because of my college degree, I was handpicked to become what would now be called a weapons of mass destruction officer. Uh, while I had been previously in the army, I had already been teaching classes with, in gas masks and and protective equipment. So during the Gulf War, I trained thousands of Allied troops in uh, protective equipment. There was a lot of very special things that happened to me. Plus, after the war, we were cleaning mines and and what they now call remnants of war and other things like that. So um, despite my health issues as a child, I was able to overcome it and spend a long time. When I got back in the army, um, my unit was preparing to go to Iraq in 2004 after the invasion. And um, unfortunately, while we were training, I stepped in a hole and rebroke my foot and they had, to, I'd, I'd broken it in the Gulf War and I broke it again, same foot, same place. So they had to take some joints out. And because my contract was almost up, they just left me behind and my unit went without me, which was sad because of all the guys in my company, I was the only one that had any combat experience or had ever been to the Middle East. So. So did you get your education? And I'll give you two more things that I didn't mention. The army. Um, I was well, born. I'm sorry. No, keep going. I was born. No, I was born. Th this is an important date for a lot of stuff. I was born August 2nd, 1964. And if you remember that date, that was the day the Vietnam War started. My father wasn't even there when I was born. He was off of the Air Force. On that date, the USS Maddox was what came out later was faking an incident by attacking a number of North Vietnamese patrol boats saying they attacked them first. Mm -hmm. And then two days later, the USS Maddox and a sister ship were sailing in circles, firing their guns in all directions in the middle of a storm, saying that they were under attack by enemy forces. And that's how the United States was able to get into the Vietnam War. And on my 26th birthday, the government gave me my own war. Uh, August 2nd, uh, 1990 is when the Gulf War started. So how's that? Yeah, so it seems that birthday presents and wars go hand in hand with you. 
Yeah. Mm. So I don't want another one this birthday. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. You won't be going. There's a big discussion going on here about But BPN. I was in college and uh, – yeah, they've got you. That's that illegal VPN you were talking about the other day. Yeah, well, the thing is that, that I'm on StreamYard but, and we don't um, need a VPN. No, there uh, is no VPN well, today. About, yeah. I'm sorry? I, I was, I was going to just finish the VPN thing. Uh, yeah, we in China, you generally need a VPN, but for StreamYard, you don't. You can actually run StreamYard on your phone. You can run it on your computer. It's completely legitimate. There's a huge number of sites that are legitimate, and you can access them. Uh, you can't access Facebook. You can't access social media effectively, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook. All of those are off. But you can access a hell of a lot, including things like CNN, and I think even Fox News, although I very rarely try. Um, but you can actually access a lot of things in China without a VPN. China does not block Western sites. Western sites choose not to operate in China. Okay. And if they choose to operate, they have to store their data or data here in China. And that's the reason why Google won't operate, because there's no money for them to, to make it. But right now on StreamYard, I am currently on StreamYard and running with no VPN. So the issue is not my VPN. It keeps slowing uh, down. It seems to me I'm, see I'm seeing you cut out. I'm seeing you with delays. And you're seeing me with delays. Everything seems perfect this end. And normally when my Wi-Fi is low, I get a signal to tell me your Wi-Fi is low. Mm. But I'm not getting that. So I think it's all okay this end. So my question uh -oh. was, did you get your I education before? <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll cope. Did you get your education before or after joining the military? I, I got it simultaneously because while I was in college, I was in ROTC and I also mm -hmm. joined the National Guard. So I was able to go to college and still do military service at the same time. And okay. that was a good time to do it because it was the 1980s and Reagan was president and America had regained a lot of their feelings of patriotism. So unlike the previous decade, where ROTC students didn't wear <clears throat> their uniforms anywhere. We wore ours all the time. I, I would wear it even on days when I wasn't supposed to. I would still go to class in my dress greens and my little tie and my or my black sweater, and I would look so good. <laughs> you saw uh, the picture that you shared is actually from that time period. Yeah. I, I, I thought that was quite an old picture, having seen your face now. Okay, let let's move on from from oh, that. Thank you, Jerry. What's <laughs> what, what's going to happen? Um, it, I'm going to ask you an opinion here. America looks like it is in dire straits. I'm having a panel this evening with a group of okay. uh, Chinese experts. Actually, these are these are people who really study China, and um, we're we're talking <sighs> about. We had Raimundo okay. here, we had Yellen here, we had Conda here, we got Blinken here again coming today. So Blinken twice in the space of a couple of months, Yellen twice in eight months. Is America, this is an opinion I'm asking now, I know I know that you don't know this, I'm, I'm asking what you think. Is America looking for China to help with their, I mean, they do have a crisis of debt, they have crisis of, of um uh, all kinds of different crises. Is is America looking for China to help them, or is it looking for China to kind of create a rift so that they can move off on their own and, and compete with China adversarially? Which way is it going to go? Which direction? They're wanting to do both simultaneously. They want China to help them and die at the same time. How does that I work? I mean, that's it sounds weird, but that's what it is. The the I mean, I, I with my, my notes I put down here, the 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 Biden administration are true believers. They really hate China. They they get a, an awful lot of uh, <clears throat> well, you know, <clears throat> people can hold opposite views in their brain at the same time. 
Mm -hmm. uh, America needs China economically, right? A, a lot of, um, you know, when you were, we were talking about Americans don't like, uh, you say, you know, they don't like China's government stuff. They still go to Walmart and they buy mostly Chinese goods. I mean, a lot of comedians uh, are very vocal about this. You know, um, Dave Chappelle, a, a famous comedian over here, he said, please don't bring the uh, jobs back from China. I don't want to pay $9,000 for a for a cell phone. You know, um, they uh, but what what they're. Ah, the problem definitely is the U.S. end. Let's just give this a minute or so. We seem to have lost Andrew, and that is sad. Um, so, Ant Antwango, I'm going to... Oh, not this one, sorry. I'm going to put this one up and talk about this for a moment. I have a theory that the United States is doing something extremely uh, worrying, in my opinion. They're sending people like Yellen, and today Blinken is arriving for the second time in a couple of months, and they're coming here not with requests, not with their cap in hand. Last time Yellen came, there was absolutely no mention whatsoever of the possibility of buying more U.S. Treasury bonds by China. Uh, the reason she came was to give a warning. Don't deal with Russia. Um, curb your overcapacity. Uh, reduce your um, slave labor, forced labor, these kinds of things. So it was all a series of warnings. Now, we've got an election coming up, and that election coming up needs to have an adversary. One thing that Americans can agree on is that right now they don't like China. And so if, in my opinion, if the Biden administration comes here with a cap in hand looking for and asking for help, they will be seen as very weak and that will be the end of their administration. They, they will lose the election in, in a few months' time. So what they're doing is they're coming over here with warnings. So they can say, we told China and China didn't listen. China didn't react. China didn't do what we told them to do. And now we're going to be forced to go to war with them in order to get this. And that will lift Biden's popularity because the one thing that they can agree on, it will also lift his popularity in Australia, where 65 percent of people in Australia are threatened by China. So we've got these two countries that really feel threatened by something that China is doing. And I think that's a really big problem that uh, the, the election, the upcoming election is going to cause some kind of problem, uh, I think, anyway. Um, I, I would agree with this. Sinophobia, Anne, is ignorance. Um, it, is, it literally is in the true sense of the word. I don't like to use the word ignorant to describe people who are rude. I use the word ignorant when I describe people who don't know something. And Andrew is back. Welcome back, Andrew. Hey. You okay? They tried to stop us, Jerry, but they failed. Yeah, though they those Thank bastards. You. I wondered where you went. I was here. Yeah. I was here and chatting I was away. Here too. Uh, I apologize. Well, for whatever reason. No, you weren't. Happened. They just made you believe that you were here. Okay. Where were we going That's with right. this? Um, we're in the matrix. Yeah. Um, you were talking about, about your group. Uh, about... yeah. the, this is a really interesting comment. Biden is here today, and I think it was yesterday or the day before, there was an announcement that they're sending more money. What are they trying to do, Andrew? Okay. Well, um, a short history um, for... It's only in the, the the current administration that Taiwan has actually had any significance since the late 1970s. <clears throat> America has done some token things with them, but literally for 40 years, they just ignored it. You know, as long as nothing changed, they were quite happy. Mm -hmm. But one thing people forget about those weapons is that almost all that money is going to American companies 
that are manufacturing the weapons. You could almost think of this bill that just got passed, this $96 billion, as a giant welfare program for the arms manufacturers. Mm -hmm. Taiwan makes a, a, a nice example for them to dump tons of weapons on the island because the people who know, are in the know know that China has, is not planning on invading the island at all. All right. If you plan an invasion, you need ships, you need logistics. It's kind of obvious when you're massing the troops and everything like that. So we know for a fact that the powers that be know that China is not intending on invading Taiwan. But it sounds good to a public who doesn't know any different, right? And at the same time, it gives the arms manufacturers, well, in Taiwan's case, it's what, $12 billion out of that new package? $12 billion? Is, uh, that's a lot of money. That, that, that creates a lot of Israel jobs. And some to Ukraine, yeah. Hmm. Right. So again, it's like a big welfare program. I mean, I saw something about the budget from last year and the GDP, and a, a great deal of the economy was the government jacking up friendly industries by pumping money into them. And the mm -hmm. weapons industries is one of them. You know, it's just so. But Taiwan's a convenient excuse for that. They know China has no. I mean, my joke is, uh, you know, when there were people talking about it, I said, yeah, China invades Taiwan every day with just scores and scores of container ships unloading containers and hundreds of people or even thousands of people getting off airplanes on the island. They're they're there every day. Tourism. But yeah, to hear people that don't know the situation in the industry, right. They don't understand that because all they hear is one side. One thing I tried to mention earlier when our, we had started having trouble is as an analyst, like I said, I look at both sides and see how, how ideas China makes mistakes with America too. And it's single biggest mistake. You and I have talked about this several times is that China needs to pay for a PR program over here. Okay. Lots of countries do it. MBS did it a few years ago before, right before they played Texas Chainsaw Massacre with that guy in the embassy. But yeah. up until that point, it was good, right? They, they spent millions of dollars to say, look how wonderful Saudi Arabia is. Why don't you mm -hmm. come over to Saudi? I love Saudi Arabia myself. Mm -hmm. I actually enjoyed my time there a great deal. Um, but China needs to put some money into a PR campaign, right? They really do. Yeah. There's the a very interesting thing made happened. Up of all these different dissident groups who don't like you for one reason or another are just pouring money into politicians' pockets. They're pouring money into the media. In fact, today I didn't get a chance to look at any news except super early. There were 35 stories on my feed. Ten of them were anti-Chinese. Sorry. <laughs> Now, I'm going to tell you an interesting story. There is a, a, a thing called the Ipsos Global Happiness Index. Have you heard of that? There we go again. Okay, the Ipsos Global Happiness Index does a survey every year of 32 countries, and it establishes which countries are the happiest. In uh, 2023, China was number one, Saudi was number two, the happiest countries in the world. So the people of China, and I've been saying this for years, right. the people of China are happy. They're happy with their government, but they're generally happy with their lives. They know that Ooh. this year is better than 10 years ago and 10 years in the future will be better than now. They know this. That this is the belief. And so they're pretty happy with the way things are going. Yeah. In 2024, the Ipsos Global Happiness Index surveyed 30 countries. They left off China and they left off Saudi Arabia. But... In their data submission, when they discussed their methodology, they forgot to remove China. So they did survey China. I don't know if they surveyed um, Saudi Arabia, but they did survey China, and China was left off the 32 countries. So only 30 countries. And, and now the headlines all prove that Europeans are happier than Asians <laughs> and Middle Easterns. <laughs> so that's a very interesting de development for the Ipsos Global Happiness Index. They have now been bought by the dark side. Let's take China. We can't have China happy. Now, you said the same thing. You've been to Saudi Arabia. And I bet you if you tell any of your American colleagues that yeah, I went mm -hmm. to Saudi Arabia, they go, oh, wow, you did, you've still got both your hands or some comment like that.
you've gone very quiet on me. Yep. Okay. I yeah, we do have a time lag here. Um so let let's yeah, that where were we going with that? I've, I've forgotten where we we're coming from. You were talking about going to Saudi Arabia, you enjoyed your time there. I, I didn't need... hear what you said because it's okay. it's okay. slowing down. You you're talking about having a big PR campaign from China into the US. Why do you think they need that? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I didn't get it. Yeah. You you talked about a up. large a large campaign, a funding campaign of PR from the U from China to, to change yes. the US perception. Why do they need that? Right. So we don't have anything bad happen. I mean, that's that's it in a nutshell. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um <laughs> You were discussing once that 80% of the people in the world, I think it was in one of your videos, like China. Uh, and, but it's the other ones you need to worry about. I mean, right. the current administration, and I hope, I hope this feed goes well, the current right. administration hates China's guts. All right? I mean, whatever they say, you know, when Yellen comes over there, Blinken comes over, no matter how hard they try to be nice, they always have to say something hateful. Right. They either say something hateful before they come, while they're there or immediately as they leave. They just can't help it. They ha hate this government. They hate. Well, they hate China. But one of China's biggest advantages, uh, what we talked about earlier, Japan went through this horrible decade plus of being the most despised people in America. But at the same time, Japan was building up businesses in this country. In Tennessee alone, two of the best employers are Nissan and Bridgestone. Everyone loves Nissan and Bridgestone now. But if you went back to 1983 or 84, people, how could you work for the Japanese? China mm. needs to invest into the United States as much as it can. I know there's all kinds of laws against it, and there's all kinds of different politicians standing up against it. But China needs to lock itself as close to the United States as it can. If I can quote General Giep, all right, the, the commanding general in the Vietnam War, when he was talking about fighting Americans, he said that for, when you fight the Americans, you grab them by the belt buckle and you hold on tight. Now, what he was talking about was the fact that if you're that close to American troops, then they can't rain artillery and aircraft down on you. But in this case, the closer that China is to the United States economically, the more that the two countries work together, the less likelihood there will be that something bad will happen. Okay. Mm -hmm. The United States never goes to war against countries that they have a huge economic uh, situation with. And if you allow me to misquote Chairman Mao, I wrote a thing that said political power comes through the doors of a shipping container. Okay. The closer that China and America are together, eventually we're going to get politicians in there that will be able to bring our, to allow China to do more joint ventures, right? All China would have to do economically, if they were allowed to, was follow the same pattern Japan did and things would work out. But this current administration has a lot of problems. You mentioned several problems. And they are definitely true believers. And the problem with a true believer is you can't convert them. Now, mm -hmm. if, if I can be a little political here, um, in, in 2019, candidate Biden said that yep. China was no competition to the United States economically. I mean, I've got his whole quote here if we, we wanted to read it. He said yeah, there was, was no way that, they, and even yeah. his political opponents told him, that's not, that's not right. You're acting crazy. Why are you saying something that off? Well, we know why, right? We both know why, because his family was making an awful lot of money out of China. BHR was a major source of their income. And then what happened a few months later, right? His son was ousted from there and they lost that money. If you want to look at a timeline, and I've done this, 
set up a timeline of when Biden suddenly switched, you can see that it has to do exactly with his family losing that large amount of money. I mean, as president, at one point, he was ad-libbing during the State of the Union, raving at who would want to be Xi Jinping to today. You know, his, his handlers had to come out afterwards and, and clear that up. So, yes, mm -hmm. the administration needs China, wants China's help, mm -hmm. but they also want you all to die. They really do. Just go away and die. One hell of a contradiction. I mean, it's, it's, it sounds crazy, and One I know hell. it's a total contradiction. But it's a fact, okay? And my concern, okay, th this will sound funny, but again, I'm an analyst. I was famous for always looking at things in an unusual direction. These, the wars in Ukraine and in Yemen, Israel, Gaza area, and all the other problems they've had has actually been good for China as far as the United States is concerned because it's, it's diverted a lot of American attention away from their so-called pivot to the Pacific. If you remember, very soon after um, the Russians invaded Ukraine, Blinken felt the need to fly to Hawaii and say that despite the Russian invasion, China is still the greatest threat in the entire world. Mm. And I was like, to who? The only threat was to his bank account. I mean, seriously. But there are a lot of business people in America who want to work more with China. They would love to have operations in China and here. And I think, and we, we've discussed this off, and I'm going to say it out loud and everybody, all of our elections are either or in this country. You've got one candidate or the other. Running for president, the only hope China has in the coming election is Donald Trump. Now, that's just a flat and analyst speaking right there. Yes, he says a lot of anti-Chinese things right now, but guess what? All the people around him are anti-Chinese. Mm. Why don't we get some people around him that are pro-China? I mean, one of the most amazing things to me, I, I'd written a, an article years ago that an American president should one day go to Cuba, Iran, North Korea, and settle all these stupid Cold War leftovers, all right? They're just ridiculous. They don't, they don't have any functionality anymore. <clears throat> and Donald, Donald Trump actually reached out to North Korea. Yep. He got crowds of conservative Republicans yep. to cheer for the, for the leader of North Korea. And he said, let's open up North Korea and we'll build hotels and all, you know, make it a tourist, tourist destination. Now, that's, that's going to take a while to work, but what other American president ever reached out that far? Well, Nixon? He is. Well, yes, but Nixon, you know. Yeah. <laughs> if, Trump um, needs to go to China, and says, and uh, I, I tend to agree with well, that. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, yeah. Do you think and Trump I mentioned should it to come you to China that before or after the election? before right. in my feeling and you said to me when we were talking china doesn't operate this way but i'm sorry if you play this is like a giant game of poker and if you always play the same way with every hand you're going to lose period yep. end of discussion all right yep. um g yep. g needs to come out and say donald trump is a leader of america that i worked with and i can work with again Invite him to come. Invite him to come to China. If he can't come to China beforehand because he does have some legal issues going on. Here we go again. Then um, invite him. Be the first leader to say, come over to China even before he's sworn in. Right. There's mm -hmm. several months between November and January. Come on over. Throw him a giant party like they did in Saudi Arabia and India. Show him it's a yep. great time. Yeah. And guess yeah. what? All of a sudden, th this sounds funny. I know a lot of people will not agree with me on this because when you and I were talking, <clears throat> but the 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 real the real hope China has is the conservative Republicans. Yeah, I did a series and people of will say, shows. You're right. Yeah, I did a series of shows last week on um, MAGA communism, 
which I find to be quite fascinating. Uh, you know, it, it, to me, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big contradiction. The conservative socialists, if if there is such a thing, yeah. And uh, I, I'm I'm busy compiling. I'm, I'm I'm writing an article about that, and I'm compiling this. It's a very difficult article to write. Actually, it's one of the hardest I've ever written because I'm trying to write it in a way that is neutral as opposed to supportive. I see the future of the United right. States being a form of capitalism with American characteristics in the way that China has socialism with Chinese characteristics. And the characteristics are that each country has capitalism. They must have. In order to, to make a country work, you must have some degree of capitalism. And the MAGAs have got it right. They say, well, yeah, but we right. still need Medicare for all. We still need free education, or at least cheap, edu affordable education. We need an education that brings our, 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 our country up rather yes. than holds our country down. Uh, and you, and you, we've, we've talked about it before, American education. Nowadays, it's even, even your, your education department says this, most Americans can't read beyond a grade six book and comprehend or understand what this book is about. So effectively, Harry Potter is the limit for a lot of right. Americans. Uh, and that and that's the way that we need to look at it. Um, Derek saying this then this is a very true statement. There is no true communism. And if you have true capitalism, you're going to get what America is getting right now, uh, excess of poverty, excess of of drugs, excess of crime, excess of I mean, all the things that are nasty about capitalism are coming to are coming home to roost in the USA. So I think, both countries right. need to look at it. China's already looked at it, you know, six, 70 years ago and said, we need to do when this. the Soviet Union collapsed. Mm. Oh, I'm sorry. Go on. Keep going with the Soviet Union collapse. Okay. Um, I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't hear your question because it, it, it slurred it out so hard. I, I didn't, it didn't, I didn't get any of the words. But okay. when the Soviet Union collapsed, I wrote an article. The first thing I said is, yeah, this, when the Soviets collapsed, the West spent all their time high-fiving each other about how great it was that they won the Cold War and then going in there and stealing all the Russians' resources. Okay, my article was like, no, we need a Marshall Plan to save the Russian people from what will happen to them. And a lot of people said, oh, that's not going to happen. I said, look, my mother grew up in a place that this exact thing happened. All right. We had mm -hmm. Germany after World War I completely devastated. What did they do? They went all the way to the right because that was the only way to come back and hurt the people that hurt them. I said, if you don't help the Russians, they're going to never forgive us for stealing all their resources and put him in that situation, and one day they're going to want to pay us back. So what you were talking about is if the United States, which I don't know if it will collapse right now because the way no. international money works, but if America does have serious problems that we need to address, the one country with the resources to do it is China, the G2 again. We always keep revolving mm -hmm. around to the G2. These two countries working together together can solve anything, period. I don't care what it is. Everyone who always says it won't work, I always bring up smallpox. During the middle of the Cold War, a Soviet doctor decided that smallpox was killing way too many humans. And he reached out to his bosses and said, let's work with the Americans and we will cure smallpox in the whole world. And his bosses said no. That, that won't work. The Americans will just not work with us. And he said, well, why don't we at least try? And they reached out through the UN. And by the mid 70s, I think it was the last person in the world who had a case of smallpox. These two mm -hmm. countries who had 125,000 mm -hmm. nuclear bombs pointed at each other decided that this disease was worth <laughs> getting together to wipe out. Yeah, a, a great example of uh, it, two it, adversaries working together, in, uh, not in competition. Um, China can cure cancer. 
Same thing. Right. But it isn't um, isn't likely to happen. Well, there you go. But I mean, um, a, one thing we haven't talked about is like when I try to reach out to Americans, like we both said, Americans, it's it's not our fault. It's what we get over here. Mm -hmm. Whenever I talk about China in a positive way, I usually try to compare it to something that's going on in the United States. Like they will say, oh, you know, they don't have free elections in China. And I said, no, no, no. They use a tiered system where these people vote for the next level, that votes to the next level and votes to the next level. And then people will tell me, well, that's not democracy. And I'm like, well, um, in the Constitution, that's how senators used to get picked. In each state, the people would vote for the state legislature and then the state legislature would vote for the two senators. And that did not change until about 1913 with a constitutional amendment. So are we saying there was no real democracy for picking senators for half mm. of the United States history? Also, when people mm. say that, I'll say, hey, then guess what? You've never voted for president because you don't vote for president. You vote for a list of electors who will then go to the electoral college and they pick the president. Right. That's tier. And when you describe things like that to people, then they go, oh, OK, I think I understand that now. And so mm -hmm. in various situations, whenever something's going on with China, I try to say, OK, it's like this in America. And I've talked to you about it and I've written articles on it, like the situation with Taiwan. OK, Taiwan, everyone recognizes Taiwan. Even Biden said it the other day that Taiwan is part of China, but we're still going to ship them a lot of guns. Mm -hmm. The, the closest situation to that is the Confederate States of America. And the example I use is if the Civil War in America had happened and the, and the British Navy sailed in and rescued the Confederate government and took them all to Cuba, and then they've been there for the last 150 years trying to destroy the United States, you can understand the kind of the, the, sim, the feelings that the Chinese have over that island. Yeah, and yeah. there are people when I talk to them, they go, OK, now I can understand that. I can understand why they feel that way. You know. So here's another question. If democracy is working. Oh, I like that. One. You, yeah. Why do you only have Trump and Biden as the best you've got? Now, here's another thing. These people are not they, they're selected in order to be elected. And this is something that happens in China, too. So you're, you're absolutely right. Are these two guys the best that you can get? I mean, they're both in their, they, they, I think they're both in their 80s or will be by the time the election is done. Are they, are mm. they the best you've got? Well, see, now again, as a scientist, there's no such thing as best. All right. We don't use terms like that. Um, so I'm not trying to avoid the question, but I am, uh, let me use a comparison. The year I was born, 1964, was an election year, okay? Only 12 states had primaries, roughly, for, for one of the parties, 12 states. The other states all had conventions, which is how the United States used to pick their candidates. And what that meant was, in each state, the party bosses picked all the candidates, OK. And the party bosses got kickbacks from the people who won. Right. So in, in when like when FDR was picked, people did not pick FDR to be the Democrat candidate. All right. He was picked by the leaders of the Democratic Party. Same thing with his Republican opponents. Primaries are the majority of the states now, but still not all of them. So my question is when when their question is, are they the best two? Again, I like pop culture references. Think about it like a game show, right? Mm -hmm. These are the two candidates. The guy that won Survivor the first year was the absolute worst person on the island, right? He ran around naked and did all that other stuff, but he still won because he was able to defeat all the other candidates. So Biden and Trump are the two people who survived the process to get to the top. So in <laughs> some ways, they are the best, because they're the best politicians to get up there. Right. Are they the right. physically best, you know, mentally? Um, I can't say. Mm. But again, 
if you're a good president, you will pick people to do all the, the, the heavy lifting for you while you're in office. Yeah. All the secretaries, all the positions below hand. Uh, uh, the army used to say the best leader is the one who does nothing else, which means you just lead, right? right. You lead, you give the orders and your people follow your orders. So are they the best two? I would say that, they're, again, they're the two that survived the process. But that was an excellent okay. question. Yeah. yeah. I know that, 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 that sounds fishy, but that's exactly the answer. Hmm. Yeah, it sure is. Um, there's a there's a debate going on about EVs in America. You you can get an electric vehicle in America and get subsidies from the government, but only if it's an American built right. electric vehicle. Is that right? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Yes, I don't have one myself. Okay. The, the the arguments against EVs right now are the exact same arguments that people used in the post World War II thing about automobiles. There was a very good article I saw where someone it was no it was actually a video where someone in like 1946 was talking about how cars were going to change America. What most people today do not realize is that their ancestors living in that time did not own a car. Right. Until right. Eisenhower built the interstate system, we did not have gas stations everywhere. So when people come to me and they say EVs are bad. They're not going to work. I say, no, no, no. We're exactly where we were then. We can mm -hmm. build the, the stations. We can build all the infrastructure. And then a couple of generations from now, people will not even realize how much trouble we went through today. Yeah. Yeah. So the, they've done that in China. The infrastructure came first. Um, in one city, they built the infrastructure and then changed every taxi, every bus right. into electric electric. And they've done that. I mean, now I would say probably three in 10 cars here in the city where I live are electric. But five years right. ago, it was one in 10. And, and I guess in right. five years time, it'll be eight in 10. It's, it's that it's changing that fast. And what's the, the great thing about it is you probably wouldn't notice this because you live in a country that has a massive space and not so many people. We used to have no blue skies ever i came to china in 2004 never saw a blue sky until i went back to australia uh, several months later <coughs> for a holiday here now i mean it's pouring with rain outside now because it's that time of year but we get blue skies when the rain clears i remember that out comes the rainbow and the sunshine it really is good mm. so um you it's had a, a list the, of things that you wanted to the 2008 discuss the olympic yeah yeah. Mm. You you had a list of things that you wanted to discuss today. Is there anything on your list we haven't covered yet? Mm -hmm. The answer mm -hmm. to this is no. Yeah, um, I, you're it's slurred again. But um, yeah. yes, I remember the 2008 Olympics. There was a lot of complaints about how oh. Beijing had all that health trouble. Yeah. Yeah, in Beijing, they closed down the power stations and uh, they closed down a lot of things uh, to create blue skies. Uh, okay. That was 2008. You know, we're talking 16 years ago. It's it's a very, very Indeed. different place now. Very different. Mm. So the question um, that you 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 said... I'm sorry. At the, at the beginning, I can't, Andrew... I can't hear uh, the whole thing again. Sorry. Okay. At the beginning, you said you had a list of things you wanted to discuss. Is there any more on that list? You can't hear me. I'm going to put the comment up. Okay. This is this is the Let's first time I've there, done There's this. some good questions today. I like that. Very insightful questions. Yeah, you can. What I especially them. like while we're doing this is. <laughs> oh boy. Um, let me think. I mentioned a lot of things. Um, as as I um, 
as we and I have talked about privately, the two things that the United States really loves is the fact that they are the number one military power in the world. You mentioned that earlier. And that they're also the number one economic power in the world. Now, neither one of these existed before World War II, right? Mm -hmm. And before World War II started, the United States had a smaller army than Portugal, right? Tiny little army relative to their nation. <clears throat> but everything changed with World War II. For most Americans, though, because it's been so long, this, this is how things are, what I'll put in quotes, normal, right? It's normal that America's on top and everybody else is not, okay? Mm -hmm. And historically, if either one of those situations is threatened, the United States will use the other one to put themselves back in, in that position. <clears throat> There's an excellent book called The Banana Wars, which mm -hmm. is a discussion of U.S. foreign policy in America uh, over the over the, the decades when we were constantly intervening down there. And you'll see that it was all economic. I mean, if you go on the State Department's website and you see why doesn't America work with Cuba, it all has to do with the fact that American corporations and individuals lost money mm -hmm. in the revolution. And so we spent... Well, by the end of the 60s, we spent 10 times as much as they lost just trying to overthrow Cuba. It would have been yeah. cheaper to just have the government give everybody a check. <clears throat> so <laughs> what America doesn't like. <laughs> so what America doesn't like about China is China is bumping up on number two, right below number one. Right. Xi said it not long ago. We have no desire to overtake America as number one. And I believe him on that because, mm -hmm. well, frankly, for one thing, it'll be dangerous. All right. Um, with, with all the stuff going on around the world right now, as I mentioned, the Biden administration has still put an awful lot of U.S. assets into the Pacific. Correct. <clears throat> Military assets of all kinds. There are U.S. troops, what, six miles off of the Chinese coast now? Yeah, three miles. And those guys are there. For the exact same reason. How many? Three miles. Three? I didn't. Three okay. miles. But anyway, those guys are there for the exact same reason that there are troops in South. Oh, three miles. Okay, thank you. There, Those guys are there for the same reason that there are troops in South Korea. If anything happens, the United States will be able to call in all of NATO to jump on China. OK. And as you talk about a lot, they've been doing a awful lot of military stuff with Australia and South Korea and Japan and all these. It's all pointed at one foe. Right. They're not they're not mm -hmm. looking at North Korea, though. They've been giving them some trouble. The Biden administration wants so bad for something to happen. OK. Or and depending on and I'm not trying to predict, but if if the election looks bad enough, Remember that 1964, the year I was born, was an election year. And uh, we engineered a war three months before the election and Johnson won. What's up at the U.S. border? Oh, boy, yep. that's a very popular subject right now here. <clears throat> Whenever countries historically go through <laughs> economic hard times like the United States has right now, they always become very resentful of immigrant populations who might be either taking their jobs or are suppressing wages, okay? Both, both things are just as bad. Now, what a lot of people don't realize was that through World War II into the 1960s, the United States had an agreement with Mexico to bring in foreign workers. There was mm -hmm. a quota system, they could come in, work in the United States for several months, and then leave, right? Now, both sides violated this agreement. The, uh, the, they were, so the uh, Mexico was shipping more people than they were supposed to. The, the people who were employing these people were not giving them the wages and living standards they were supposed to get. And eventually, the whole system broke down. So right now, especially among conservative Americans, the border is one of the biggest questions they have. They keep talking about tens of thousands, well, millions, millions and millions of people have come in since the Biden administration came in. 
the uh, the it's, funny it's one you and I were laughing the, uh, about the other day was they're all concerned about these military age Chinese guys that are coming into our country. And they're either coming in for one or two things, depending on who you listen to people. They're either a pro private army sneaking in to start a war or they're all spies. And as you and I were laughing about the other day, yes, a Chinese guy is going to go to a military base and try and spy on them in this current environment. Yeah, that'll work. Okay, if anyone has ever seen Star Trek Four, there's a scene where it mentions that there's tension between America and Russia, and then Chekhov, the Russian guy on the ship, is asking where the military naval base is in Alameda, and this policeman is just looking at him, and he's like, what's wrong with this policeman? And that that's the same thing. It's really ludicrous that China's <laughs> going to ship in tens of thousands of spies and hope that a few of them are going to be successful. I mean, that's right. almost as much fun as when the balloon came flying over my country. I, I had a lot of fun with the balloon. Yeah. I, I actually that, know people who yeah. ran outside to shoot at the balloon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they missed, no doubt. Yeah. I'm yeah. like, well, apparently they did. It, yeah. took, it took a multi-million dollar rocket to bring it down in the Atlantic. And, and, and um, then what, what, like all those other silly incidents, if you look, yeah. Well, it turned out it was a weather balloon. I'm sorry, go on. It, it cut out. It turned out it was a weather balloon, yep. nothing else. Uh, in, on, on a Friday afternoon in June of the same year, the Pentagon gave a short little briefing. And basically the guy gets up and says, the balloon was not spying. Thank you. That's it. And they're gone. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to answer this That's question. That's another thing people brought up. Yeah, I, I know ahead. the answer to this one. I've actually made a video about this um, several months ago now, um, that these, mm -hmm. they're not police stations. Um, effectively, uh, there has been no charges. There has been uh, <sighs> two people were arrested in New York. Neither of them have, have to this date been charged. So we're talking, I think, more than a year now. It's not a few months. It's more than a year so it's basically fizzled out to nothing. And um, there was a researcher at one of the big universities, I think Yale, maybe Harvard, who wrote a report about this. The story came about purely by a, an organization called Safeguard Defender. The uh, CEO or founder of Safeguard Defender was a, is, I think he's either Swedish or Danish, Swedish, I think. And he was arrested in China as a spy. He was kicked out of China, and he created an NGO, which is an anti-China NGO. And this is this is a pure work of fiction, total work of fiction that just got traction. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the fact that no one has been charged, no one has been convicted, nothing has ever happened as a result of it, tells you how good that the research of the media is. They know that within a couple of days, everything will be forgotten. And it is now it's forgotten. So Antoine, thank you for bringing that up. Um, oh yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a good point. Yeah. Did you have anything to add to that? I mean, for, as One far of, as I'm concerned, it's 100 fiction. I mean, no, you're right. I mean, I wrote about it too. I'm like, well, okay, let's start charging these guys. You know, what are they in Gitmo? There's still guys in Gitmo for 20 years waiting for their charges. That's true. Some of them were Uyghurs as well. There's no you know, Uyghurs left in Gitmo and, now. And, ah, but what did they do with the Uyghurs? That's the funny part. When the Uyghurs were released from Guantanamo, uh, they China asked for them, and the U.S. refused. And in some cases, they released them into the suburbs of Washington, D.C., where there's a Uyghur community, and then other yeah. ones were shipped to other countries. But it is funny yeah. that you hold a guy in Gitmo for years, and then you say, oh, yeah, go live in the suburbs outside of Washington, D.C., no problem. Mm. Okay. Yeah. They, they um, Albania, I think, got some of them, too. Uh, they're welcome. That's all I can say. Uh, they, it's very interesting that they used a Uyghur, when they were interviewing them, they used yeah. a Uyghur who openly admits that she tried to turn them, they were going to send them back to China and turn them against China. But of course, 
what China will do with them the moment they arrive back is lock them up because they're extremists, they're terrorists. They are. Yeah. They were in. They were in Guantanamo for a purpose, and that is because they they were not innocently captured in mm -hmm. Afghanistan or Pakistan or wherever it was they were captured. Now, as no, uh, no, no, Trevor no. says, this, Afghanistan. This is a fact. Yeah. <laughs> the CIA now uses them to tell lies. I think that was a, that was probably yeah. a precondition. And the oh, Treasury yeah. Department loves hiring forgers. Do they? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So, who better? We, I mean, seriously, if you're a really good forger, why not teach classes for the Treasury Department? True. If you're a really good hacker, you get a good job as a um, as a security consultant. Yeah, National Cri Security crypto. Agency. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? Crypto security. Why? Yeah. So we're getting we're why getting waste to all the that talent. Exactly. So we're getting to the 90 minute point, which is about the time I usually wind these things up. It's been a great okay. chat. Is there, is there anything, Andrew, that you want to add to this before we depart? <clears throat> well, I mean, we did have a lot of technical problems, so I hope that we get yeah. to do this again sometime yeah. soon. And I, I appreciate yeah. you doing this. But um, again, there there is no reason realistically why our two countries cannot be the best of friends yes i would encourage everyone and i wish you would share it in here when reagan went to china in 1984 he gave the most wonderful speech about america and china working together there are people that will say oh the situation has changed since then not really okay the all the differences we have between our countries are over money do people really want to fight over money I mean, America and China can work together to solve every problem in the human race. Mm -hmm. And we mm -hmm. should. And let's not let anyone stand in our way. Keep doing the things you're doing. You know, the reaching out through the social media to the young people. You making your videos, talking to as many people as you can. People share Jerry's videos and other content. Whenever somebody says something that sounds crazy to you, like the balloon thing, Ask hard questions like I did. Yeah. You know, why would they send a balloon like that? You know, and things, but always push back. And that's one thing that I wanted to mention earlier was when China does its campaign, they need to do a campaign of PR and they need to push back on a lot of this. Not just the way they do with those four hour answers that they give to questions on some of their things. They need yeah. to be witty. They need to be snarky as hell and they need to come back and go, look, you know, we don't want to fight you. You don't want to fight us. Let's all be friends. Let's all make money. What's wrong with that? Nothing. So I, I will ask the yeah. Ministry of Foreign Affairs to give you a call and get you over here for a, a new job, a new assignment to script write for them. Why not? I, can, I Why definitely not they need some translators. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> they're pretty they're pretty good at their job but they it's just the way China but is. actually I special. am now that you mentioned that uh I am looking at uh trying to I'm sorry no I lost you for a moment you were looking at trying to and then we lost you oh. um I am looking at becoming I mean I, as you know I write a lot of articles I have a blog I hope you will share it somewhere on here um, I'm looking to find a position where I am a researcher analyst full time so that I can do more of this right now, all the stuff you and I talk about, I do this as a hobby. Me I have too. a regular full time office job right now. And then in the evenings I come home and I research world affairs. Um, yeah. I wrote an article in Afghanistan where yeah. when the Taliban were sweeping across the country, I said, it's 1975 all over again. They're going to roll over them. And everybody in the Pentagon said, oh, no, it's going to take them a year. Nope, it didn't. It took three months. Yeah. It's so, yeah, leave you there. call them up. Yeah, yeah you can measure yeah. it in days. But I would dearly so, love to talk to you some more. And, and what I would like, if we could, maybe sometime people put in questions and we just answer a lot of questions. That would be that would be really interesting. Yeah, we, we can always do that. So let, let's organize this for another a month down the track. Let's let's go a month down the track, and hopefully we'll have better signal. 
because okay. this has been a little frustrating. But uh, it has been good having you on the show. There have been some good questions in there. And as we get to okay. an hour and 30 minutes, uh, so 90 minutes section, I think it's time to say thank you, everyone, for your time, your questions. And thank you, Andrew, for joining us uh, tonight or today. Thank you, Jerry. Morning. And it's, 